Hello fiber friends! It is time for an update on the Lundbring Distaff because I've been practicing and I have a few things to share. There are a couple things to be mindful of when we are experimenting with old tools. One of those things is that we don't have the context of those old tools. Whatever skills we have came from modern tools modern ways of looking at things, and the context for how an older tool may have been used is lost. So when I first started to play with this distaff, it was taking me out of my comfort zone, for sure. And so when you're out of your comfort zone and you're trying to figure something out, I think that it's just a natural tendency, a natural in inclination to go back to what you're the most used to, like what's the most comfortable. And so for me, I felt like I wanted to use a drop spindle, a fully suspended spindle, because that is how I learned spindle spinning, as I think a lot of modern crafters do. Nothing wrong with that, it's a great spindle, but it's not quite the right tool for this context. So since making that video, since uh, getting my hands on this <laughs> beautiful distaff, which I absolutely love, love working with this distaff, since getting my hands on it, um, I've, I've done a lot of practice, I've also done a lot of research. So some of that research has involved looking at what materials and tools we have evidence of from contemporary time periods and also culture. Some of the tools that have been found alongside other uh, Norse handheld uh, distaff finds include spindle whorls and possibly spindle sticks. These are two replica spindle whorls uh, that I have acquired and they're, they're a little bit heavy um, but they're also small and close to the center of the spinning. When you have something with a heavy rim where the weight is on the outside, it spins for a long time, but it's a little slower. With this weight very close to the shaft, it spins much faster. But because it's spinning faster, that energy gets used up faster. And so it doesn't make sense to spin with it as a drop spindle because I had to constantly keep giving it energy to keep making it spin. And that got very frustrating. So what I've discovered is that in hand or clasped spinning is the way to go with a handheld distaff. I can actually spin quite a bit of yarn very efficiently with this style of distaff. Um, <laughs> you'll notice I don't have a whorl on my spindle right at this moment, and the reason for that is because I started dropping my spindle, I realized that with the weight of the whorl on my, on my spindle shaft, it was getting heavy with all of the yarn adding to the mass of it and I started dropping it and so I took the one whirl off and I exchanged it for the smaller whirl but then I started <laughs> dropping it again and so I took that off and now um, I'm spinning very well knock on wood not dropping it and I have quite a good amount of wool uh, loaded up on this spindle stick and I don't need the weight anymore because the wool itself is providing that mass to give it the burst of momentum so that it spins around in my hand. Now as far as where the handle goes, I believe that my initial inclination for holding the distaff was to hold it in the center as opposed to at the base of it. And I still find that to be true. I still find that having my hand here um, is great and it doesn't slip. It feels very secure and I don't have to hold very hard. In fact, it, it doesn't feel heavy to me. When I hold it down here, it definitely feels unwieldy. It feels heavy. It feels top heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and very awkward. But when I hold it in the center, it's it's completely comfortable, which um, 
with that pin at the bottom there. Many people were asking if it was a pin to stick it in the ground to have your hands free or something. Um, and were that the case, this would be very short. If this was to stick it in the ground, I just want to explain that this would only be as high as my knee, and so I'd be reaching pretty low to get at the wool, but, but possibly. Uh, because we don't have images or texts or people who can come and explain exactly how they were spinning at that time. It's all just guesswork. It's all our best guesswork. But I am, I'm fairly sure that as a spinning tool, I'm very pleased with this. Um, and I like the yarn I'm spinning, for sure and I'm getting much more proficient with it. I can almost just do it without thinking. Um, I mean, we're just chatting here, aren't we? And I'm just spinning away. I have this lovely cob built up on this spindle. So let me, let me start a new spindle because I do think I'd like to uh, try plying this yarn. This is some Shetland that I'm spinning, by the way. It's a bat, and I thought that it made sense to spin something that would have been as close as we can imagine, <laughs> as close as we can figure, accessible to the people using this type of distaff. And so I was thinking about sheared wool. We do know that they combed wool because we do have evidence of combs and we have evidence of the tines that were found. The wood most mostly had rotted away from some of those archaeological finds. But uh, a lot of the primitive sheep, the Northern European short-tailed um, sheep, a lot of those sheep had the capability to rue, which means that you could just kind of peel the wool off. They would shed it in, in one big fleece, and you could pull the wool off at the right time when the animal was ready for that and you didn't have to actually cut or shear the wool so I thought what would be similar to having a rude fleece that maybe I could put on this distaff and spin so this is some Shetland it it was carded but it does have some lanolin in it again we don't know how much were people washing the fleece were they scouring it were they fermenting it uh, were they just running the sheep through a stream and then ruining them when they came out the other side waiting for a good rainstorm to rinse them off we don't know but I do know that spinning with a little grease in the fleece in this style in this method is actually helping me get a much thinner and finer thread so that is something that I find pretty neat so let me demonstrate up close what I'm doing with this hand. I am giving the tip of the spindle a flick with my fingers and then it, it spins for just a second, a brief second in my fingers and then I, I grasp it with my ring finger or my pinky finger um, so it, it doesn't fall, <laughs> so I don't drop it. And that initial burst of a spin is what the whorl uh, being heavier and closer to the shaft helps me to, to maintain. I want that short, quick burst of energy to have it spinning. So this is what that Looks like this is awkward holding it up. So I think I'm going to aim the camera a little differently here. Let me get set up for that. That little clicking sound that you hear is the yarn uh, flicking off the tip of the spindle and it makes that sort of chattery sound which I think is very cool. I wonder if that's a thing that you would normally hear. <laughs> I make that sound. I don't know if most people make that sound, but I just picture a group of, of women spinning together and that soft little t -t 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 sound coming off of all of their spindles. And I think uh, that would just be a very cool thing to hear.
I've also noticed that it's very convenient to use my body uh, to rest the spindle on as I bring it up. I don't need to do any half hitches or anything like that. And I am very quick um, with being able to wrap the yarn up once I've spun a good length of it. I did start out the spin uh, without holding on to the fiber supply at all. And I would just rotate the spindle around and let the tension between the fiber as it was held on by the tie that was tying it to the distaff, let the tension between that and the twist coming up in the yarn I was making do the drafting for me. And it actually was a method that was kind of working. It Surprisingly, I was able to spin a good amount of yarn without even holding the fiber supply with these fingers at all. It was uh, just, I was able to turn it and it would draft just like I'm doing now. Um, but it requires sort of a gentle touch to make that work. If I hold it just right, I am able to use the twist itself as tension to bring the fiber out of the fiber supply. Um, now for my own consistency, every now and then I, I stop and smooth out where a big chunk comes through. I also find that uh, holding the fiber with my fingers and just sort of controlling it as it enters the yarn um, from this from this place up here is uh, also very effective and it does help a little bit with some of the consistency although I do have a lot of fun just using the distaff and the twist to get that yarn and that's that's a pretty fine thread I'm able to do and that's just twist and letting it run up into the fiber. While I spin with this, uh, I do find myself using my body a lot to put the tip of the distaff, to wind it up, uh, just uh, if, I get, if I get stuck in a spot and I need to fix something, I find myself a lot of times using my body as a tool. And it really makes me wonder. I definitely think one of the next steps for me, I want to make the apron dress costume and I want to hand spin and hand weave it, but I think I need to do a costume ahead of time. <laughs> I think I'm very, very curious if there were things as a part of the clothing um, that would make a difference to how how the spinning works, how the spinning happens, maybe a way to store extra spindle whorls so that it's on hand when you need to switch to a smaller one because uh, the one you had was getting too heavy with the amount of wool you have built up now. Or um, perhaps having uh, something on a belt, not for the distaff. A lot of people wondered about that and that's a totally legitimate question. Uh, maybe uh, not for the distaff, but I'm wondering if maybe there's a way to do a little bit more of a supported spin and rest the tip of the spindle on something maybe I don't know, but I can't try these things out without the costume So I think I'll be making an apron dress, but I'm just going to uh, purchase some linen and maybe I'll weave the maybe I'll weave the um wool for it. It'll probably take five or six yards of wool uh, to make an apron dress costume for me. So that's a lot of spinning. <laughs> the weaving goes fast. I'm not worried about the weaving. Uh, it's the spinning that just takes so long to do. <laughs> 
I hope that you're enjoying my further experiments and explorations with this. I'm definitely going to need some more Shetland wool or other breeds of this type, these more primitive breeds. Um, and definitely I want to explore more with the combs and there's just so many adventures to have, so many discoveries to make. And I also think whether or not these are the actual ways that people used these tools historically, um, there is no way to know, but I do think that there is a modern context for these tools. Makes me happy. It's a place I can express some creativity. I'm making something. This yarn didn't exist until I showed up to turn it into yarn. And playing with different tools is just a lot of fun. So whether these techniques are historically accurate or historically approximate, they are still a lot of fun. I will of course include links in my video description so that you can find more resources, links to other spinners and other researchers who are exploring these methods of spinning. I think it's really important uh, just within the community to acknowledge each other, share knowledge, explore, um, and discover things together. It's like, why are we each going to reinvent the wheel on our own? <laughs> Let's do it together and progress to other discoveries, right? One of the other things I definitely want to do as I get more practice and more proficiency with this type of spinning is that I really want to do some uh, yarn duplication from the information that we have from extant garments to look at the yarn themselves. They have the information of the diameter of the yarn, how much twist is in the yarn, and I would love to be able to do some of that very technical duplication of those yarns with these tools and just have some fun experiments that way. I am just, that fascinates me for sure. And just while making this video, I've been able to get a good little amount on there. And this, and this yarn is a pretty decent size, so it's not bad. All right, friends, I will definitely give you more progress updates in the future as I discover more things, become more proficient, practice with these historic ancient tools. Um, it's just so much fun. So I'll wish you, of course, happy spinning, and I'll see you in the next one.